uh, what they call the AMIC program, where we're bringing uh, students in business schools uh, across the world to come and you know have some kind of experience in businesses in small businesses in Africa. We've done several things. We 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 make donations to the best students in certain disciplines in in, in the universities. In April 2014, Parminervir OBE was invited by Tony Elomelu to help structure the Tony Elomelu Entrepreneurship Program. Parminder is an award-winning film and television producer, expert investments and emerging markets. When I arrived, uh, Mr. Elumelu was thinking that we should give $10,000 as a, as a grant. So one of my first things was also to really change the mindset. Entrepreneurs don't need grants, they need investment. They need to know that you as an investor, an angel investor, a family or a friend are taking a risk with your capital in, in, their, in, in their enterprise. Yeah? So the word seed capital investment or a non-returnable seed capital in investment was introduced. Entrepreneurship is teachable and learnable. I totally believe in that. Um, what sustained me was the phenomenal network that I built. So networks are really, really critical. Um, information, quality information um, that's available, which is selected and curated. And also, obviously, funding. Yeah, and, and, and mentoring. Mentoring is absolutely critical. So I guess I set about, you know, leveraging my own experience as an entrepreneur and as a filmmaker to see how I could transfer those skills to designing the framework for the Tony Illumilu Entrepreneurship Program. And what emerged after eight, I think it was 10 months of, of, of doing that, was the seven pillars of TEAP. The seven pillars of TEAP provide a unique system of effective and intensive support for the startup. Having steered the development of a model for Pan-African, multilingual and sustainable program, Mr. Elumelu launched the Tony Elumelu Entrepreneurship Program. He also declared 2015 as the year of African entrepreneurship. My life has come, as I said, in a full circle, because today, the lucky entrepreneur I was at some point we today embark on the journey of giving back to the continent that has given so much to me and doing it if I may say so at an unprecedented level. Through the Elumelu Entrepreneurship Program I am committing 100 million US dollars to support the next generation of African entrepreneurs. The program represents a decade-long commitment to support 10,000 African entrepreneurs and startups. The program is open to entrepreneurs from all 54 African countries. Over the next 10 years, our goal is to generate a million jobs through these 10,000 businesses and to help contribute at least Hi everyone, my name is Okocha Nkem, I'm the founder of Mama Money. So Mama Money is a social enterprise that empowers poor women in rural and urban slum communities with free vocational and financial skills. Also, we provide access to finance for these poor women. The major challenges I had were getting access to finance to grow our business and also mentorship and the Tony Lumelu Foundation helped me to achieve this. They gave me a seed grant of $5,000 to grow our business and also provided a mentor in my sector that is the financial sector. I was given one of the best mentors on the platform that is the CEO of UBA Capital, Mrs. Oluwato Insane and through our guidance we've innovated a lot of things in Mama Money. Uh, Joel Chero, a young mother farmer from uh, the Mount Elgon Slope of Sebei. I am also a Tony Elumelu Fellow, uh, a beneficiary of the 2015 100 million dollar entrepreneurship program where I was trained in modern business management, I was connected to mentorship and I also attended a two-day boot camp in Lagos, Nigeria and uh, proceeded to a tune of $5,000 fund idea. The $5,000 was a miracle in my life. 
as was able to set out the most sought after demonstration garden in Uganda, attracting visitors from all over the country, seeking knowledge on best uh, practices in agriculture. My demonstration farm was able to attract His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Uganda, uh, President Yoweri Kagutam Museveni, because of a model that has evolved out of an acre of land, earning up to $30,000 per annum. It has attracted a magnitude of international NGOs that are involved in supporting agriculture ventures among young people to partner with me. Because of the $5,000 from the Tony El Melo Foundation that started my enterprise, I have secured an MOU with an international NGO worth about $70,000 to put up an entrepreneurship training center to skill you in agribusiness. And I'm modeling it based on the Tony El Melo Entrepreneurship Program. Je suis Mathius Lawson, nominé parmi les 1000 meilleurs jeunes entrepreneurs d'Afrique par la Fondation Tony Melo en 2015. Notre défi est de nous étendre dans toutes les contrées du Bénin ou même au-delà des frontières de l'Imoz avec notre géolocalisation. Et à cet effet, nous sommes à la recherche d'investisseurs pouvant nous permettre de relever justement ce défi. Je lance ici un appel au cher Anthony Melo et à tout investisseur qui regarde cette vidéo afin de pouvoir rentrer dans le capital et de contribuer à l'essor de Bénélogie. Pour ce qui est euh, du plus grand point d'apprentissage du programme TIP, je dirais sans hésiter que euh, c'est le management au quotidien. Ça, c'est la chose la plus importante qui nous a été apprise, en tout cas qui nous a été apprise. J'ai continué mon engagement avec la Fondation Tony et Melo en allant vers des universités de la place, en allant rencontrer aussi des jeunes Bélinois qui sont dans le besoin, qui sont des porteurs de projets, à s'inscrire massivement pour, euh, le programme, au programme de la Fondation Tony et Lomelo afin de leur donner les mêmes chances que j'ai eues afin qu'ils puissent aussi se lancer dans l'entrepreneuriat africain. My name is Momar Mastal. Um, I'm a TIP entrepreneur from the Gambia. My company is uh, Tropingo Foods. We're a food processing company based in Gambia. We focus on value addition in the fruit and nut industry. One of the greatest things that I learned from the TIP program is how to structure my company and how to manage my company well. So uh, a lot of the training that we did was geared towards administrative and uh, entrepreneurship. Um, these are things that if you don't have the right background knowledge in it, um, you can easily mismanage your company, especially a growing company. Uh, another benefit is the alumni network. The alumni network is vast. Uh, there's a thousand entrepreneurs from every single African country. Um, this is a very valuable network. I stay in contact with a lot of them through the T platform and through our own private messaging. Uh, this helps me learn more about different markets. Eventually we want to expand into different uh, African markets and we've already started the process and a lot of TEEP entrepreneurs that I met during the journey have been a part of that. That is a great um, asset for my company uh, and we look forward to working with more TEEP entrepreneurs. The engagement after the program has been so awesome. I've had the opportunity to be invited to different networking events organized by the Tony Lumelu Foundation. Also, Tony Lumelu is a lender on my platform. Staffs of the Tony Lumelu Entrepreneurship Foundation are lenders on my platform. My mentor, Mrs. Oluwato Insani, has been so supportive. She is a woman that is so busy, but she takes time to listen to me. She takes time to go through things with me. She takes time to advise me. For the new alumni, the Tony Lumelu Foundation program can be a game changer for you if you properly utilize it. The seed grant is for you to invest into your business and not for you to eat it up. You need to be more accountable, you need to be disciplined, and you need to be focused. We need to become little Tony Lumelus in our various communities so that Africa can be liberated from poverty. Be disciplined, be focused. Uh, after you receive your grant from Tony Lumelu, invest it wisely and stick to your business plan. Um, the reason I say this is a lot can happen within a year. Um, I was in the same sh place as you last year and uh, today my business grew very rapidly because I stuck to the principles that I was taught 
but through the Tony Elamelu Entrepreneurship Program. So I would just like to ask you, urge you guys to believe in yourself and be disciplined. Hi everyone, my name is Okocha Nkem, I'm the founder of Mama Money. So Mama Money is a social enterprise that empowers poor women in rural and urban slum communities with free vocational and financial skills. Also, we provide access to finance for these poor women. The major challenges I had were getting access to finance to grow our business and also mentorship and the Tony Lumelu Foundation helped me to achieve this. They gave me a seed grant of $5,000 to grow our business and also provided a mentor in my sector that is the financial sector. I was given one of the best mentors on the platform that is the CEO of UBA Capital, Mrs. Oluwato Insane and through our guidance we've innovated a lot of things in Mama Money. Uh, Joel Chero, a young model farmer from uh, the Mount Elgon Slop of Sebei. I am also a Tony Elumel Fellow, uh, a beneficiary of the 2015 $100 million entrepreneurship program, where I was trained in modern business management, I was connected to mentorship, and I also attended a two-day boot camp in Lagos, Nigeria, and uh, proceeded to a tune of $5,000 fund my business idea. The $5,000 was a miracle in my life. I was able to set out the most sought after demonstration derby in Uganda, attracting visitors from all over the country, seeking knowledge on best uh, practices in agriculture. My demonstration farm was able to attract His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Uganda, uh, President Yoweri Kaguta Museveni, because of a model that has evolved out of an acre of land, earning up to $30,000 per annum. It has attracted a magnitude of international NGOs that are involved in supporting agriculture ventures among young people that partner with me. Because of the $5,000 from the Tony Elmelo Foundation that started my enterprise, I have secured an MOU with an international NGO worth about $70,000 put up an entrepreneurship training center to skill you. Hello? 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 We are behind schedule. We'd like to get the program started again. We don't want to have pockets of empty spaces in the hall. We know that we already have preoccupied seats but I've gotten the permission of the CEO of the foundation to say there will be no reserved seats. So you can come and sit anywhere near the front. You don't have to go back to the seat you were in the morning. We need to quickly get settled so we can get the program on again, so we can close early today we we have we still have a lot more for you we're going to the next session very shortly which is about emerging african innovations we will be having an inspirational talk this gentleman was at the session last year 
and the number of the beneficiaries for the first edition of the Tony Lumelu Entrepreneurs did learn a lot from him. So he will be talking to us. We have networking and breakout sessions for agriculture, the creative industries and fashion, tourism, hospitality, financial services, ICT, as well as manufacturing. We're also going to be looking at how large corporates, how organizations are supporting African entrepreneurs. So beyond the Tony Elumelu Foundation, you need to know that a lot more companies are supporting entrepreneurship in Africa and you can leverage on how these organizations are supporting entrepreneurship. We also have another panel that we put together that will talk about innovations in Africa, a very distinguished panel that you would find interesting. I think we can kickstart the program once again. Before I call on the before I call on the next or before I introduce the next program on the agenda, let me call on the CEO of the Tony Lumelu Foundation, that number of some important dignitaries who are with us this afternoon that we need to introduce to you. Part of the objective of this forum is for you to be able to network, is for you to be able to talk to these uh, very important dignitaries. Some of them are mentors for the Tony Elumelu Entrepreneurship Program. So some of them you've been talking to um, virtually, now you can see them live. Okay. I'll hand over the microphone to <laughs> Paminda. Okay, I'm going to take just two seconds. It's really important. There are people that you'll meet on the panel, but there are also people who've invested an extraordinary amount of time, their own capital, to come and experience this amazing gathering of 2016 Tony Lumlu entrepreneurs. I just want to, for Barbara Simmons, who's just traveled all the way from the United States to stand up, an educationalist, all of those in education, come and find her. Noella, where are you? Noella, glamorous Noella, stand up. Founder of Mal Mal Malaika, and she'll obviously be on the panel. Um, ICT entrepreneur, Yamadu Alexandra from the US. These are people you need to novel, all right? Yeah, even if they're eating, talking, just go find them and say, can I talk to you? Raphael, Raphael, co-founder of Jumaya. Go talk to him, retail. Sharif, co-founder of um, Yaota. Oh, wow, welcome. And Phil, where are you, Phil, from GERN? Global, where is he, where is he? he? He's not here, where is he? Oh, there, can you stand up, please? Global Entrepreneurship Research Network. Go talk to him. All the mentors, can you stand up? There's the a mentor mentors, yeah. who's traveled from China to be here. Okay. There she is. Thank you, mentors. Um, entrepreneurs, even if they didn't mentor you, go find them. Thank you. Okay, uh, the next program is on is on imaging African innovations. We've invited a cross sectional group of people to talk to us in the next 30 minutes thereabout. We're slightly changing the format 
of presentation. We're going to be having a TED style talk format for the next presentations. And I'm going to leave the moderator for the next session to introduce uh, panelists, as it were. About distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to call on Ms. Ngozi Edozien, who will be moderating the next session on Emerging African Innovations. Please come on stage. A round of applause for her. She's the founder and managing director of, of Invivo Partners. It's a, she called this more, well, I don't agree with her. It's a, it's a very big financial advisory firm. They're also, in, they're also investing and they're also into strategy consulting. Before she founded Invivo Partners, she was the managing director of Pfizer Nigeria. She is an expert in strategy, business development, and she's worked with various multinational companies in Europe, in the United States of, of America, and also in Africa. A round of applause for Ms. Ngozi Ngozi. Can you hear me? Fantastic. So I'm going to excuse myself. I have a little bit of a cold, so if I sound a bit muffled, um, just wave your hands and I'll speak up even further. But thank you very much. I think we've got a very interesting lineup of speakers for you today. And um, they will all speak about innovative businesses that they've actually started uh, here in Nigeria, one from Egypt, uh, one in, from the Gambia. And so I'll just introduce each one uh, very briefly, and then they'll go, they're going to give a, a short talk. At the end of the talk, we'll sort of summarize what we've heard, and then I'll be able to open up to the floor for questions. So please listen well. So first up, I'd like to introduce Sharif El Rakabawi, who's the co-founder of Yautu, Yauta, pardon me, um, from Egypt, and this is an interesting business, he'll tell you more about it, but it is one that is actually trying to do online comparison shopping. So, um, Sharif, very happy for you to come up. Thank you very much. Um, so my name is Sharif. I'm the co-founder of a shopping search engine called Yauta. It's an Egyptian platform that consists of a website and mobile application through which shoppers can compare prices of different products online. Uh, we've launched uh, mid-2014, so we are a bit more than two years old. And uh, last year, we've managed to land a, a Series A fund from a UAE uh, investor in uh, Abu Dhabi, worth $2.7 million, which is, thank you, which is uh, to date, as far as I know, the, the biggest Series A uh, in Egypt uh, so far. So how did we manage to do that? Particularly, what we focused on is growth. So year on year, when you look at September 2016, which was a couple of months ago, and compared to the same month in 2015, our growth was 14-fold. So I'm talking about 1,300%. And um, that's mainly due to the a, a few points that we focused on, which I'm going to mention quite briefly. First of all, we focus on technology. We focus on making the system work autonomously, automatically, meaning that I do not host any products online uh, that I sell myself. I'm an aggregator, meaning that I get all the uh, product information from different online shops in Egypt and crawl the websites automatically, so I have bots 
bots similar to the bots that Google has, uh, that visit the sites daily, get the information, and update my database to show to the users. This was very helpful in keeping the data fresh, and um, it has helped in sustaining the growth because this was very beneficial in getting top results on the Google search engine in terms of um, ranking, which as an organic traffic is a major factor in fostering growth. So focusing on technologies is the first point. The second point I would like to mention is marketing. Even with the fund we have, we cannot compete with big players in terms of market spent or marketing spent. Some of the key players pour millions of dollars monthly into marketing campaigns. We cannot compete with that. So what we do is we try to innovate in marketing. We try to, um, with relatively small budgets, focus on marketing uh, methods and target uh, segments of the uh, users that have a high return on investment. So what we do is we're focusing on our Facebook page, which uh, is around half a million, has around half a million fans so far. Uh, and we, thank you. What we do is we try to um, educate the shoppers and interact with them quite frequently about questions they have or different products, for instance, by using uh, funny cartoons. So we have, uh, we have, in fact, our own um, cartoon uh, painters, basically, people who uh, we give a specific idea and message, and they translate it into a funny cartoon. And this is working very well, in fact. The third thing I would say is being obsessed with the startup. So as an entrepreneur, you really need to be obsessed with the startup. You don't have a nine to five job, definitely. You have to follow on everything that's happening in your startup, uh, regardless of uh, when it would be, even if it's uh, at midnight uh, on a Saturday, because it's a 24 seven operation. So a user can go online anytime to uh, search for something uh, to buy. So that's the third point. Overall, um, what I would say, if I may uh, mention a, a last point in terms of what I would uh, recommend for aspiring entrepreneurs, you need to take risks. So we took a risk, a big risk. When I started the company, I was working as a management consultant in Boozen Company. I had a very comfortable, I wouldn't say life because it, it was a lot of work, I would say a very comfortable uh, job, stable job, with a six-figure salary. And I left all of that, put all my money into my current company, and it was a huge risk. It paid off. So this is probably the most important recommendation I would give, that you need to take risk, especially if you're young. Do not um, go against the flow, because the flow is typically, um, unfortunately, in Africa and the Middle East, to finish your education, go find a stable job in a multinational, resist that. I would recommend that you would resist that and you would try to pursue an uh, opportunity to start your own company. Even if you fail, that's actually good. Failure is not bad, failure is good. You're gonna try it uh, again and again until uh, you gain more experience and learn from your faults and um, make it to a success. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shuri. Um, next up, I'd like to invite uh, Shani Suleiman. Uh, Shani is the Nigeria director for Andala. Uh, he's obviously, with a name like Shani, he's obviously Nigerian himself. And you'll probably remember him because uh, I think when Zuckerberg came to Nigeria, um, the $25 million he invested in, I think it was Andela, was all over the news. So. Um, share some nuggets, even if you're not going to share some dollars. <laughs> okay, good.
Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's, a, it's an honor to be here in front of you. Uh, I'm slightly nervous because I see a few more gray hairs than, than what I have. So please, uh, for those of you that are, that are looking at me as a young chap, hopefully I have a, a word or two of wisdom I can share with you from my experiences. Uh, so let me quickly talk about Andela first, and then I wanted to leave with maybe three takeaways uh, that I believe every entrepreneur should, should sort of, uh, and every business leader really should go with. So Andela is a fairly small startup today. Um, we basically represent uh, what we think should be the, the genesis of a new generation of Africans, right? So we believe that brilliance is evenly distributed around the world, uh, but opportunity is not. Uh, and so there are many people around the world who are equally competent, equally driven, equally capable, uh, but by, by, by virtue of their circumstances, where they're born, where they live, and the environment they're in, they're not able to reach their full potential. So our mission is to basically uh, take those people and expose them to the right environments to become that. Uh, today we have almost 250 developers uh, across Lagos and Nairobi. Uh, they are mostly working on projects for leading companies around the world, uh, Microsoft, Google, uh, a few very, very innovative startups. Uh, some are still in Series A, Series B phase, and some have been bought by bigger companies. But one thing that we, they all have in common is that they're solving a need that uh, millions of people around the world uh, have. And they also happen to be in a country where their skills are not as valued uh, as they are elsewhere. So how do we do this? We basically, we go out and find very smart people. Uh, we put them through a very rigorous uh, recruitment process. And then uh, when they finally make it into Andela, uh, we spend about five or six months helping to build them up into world-class software developers. Uh, and then we have a bunch of partners that we work with around the world who have uh, roles that they've been trying to fill for five months, six months. They can't find the right people. They can't find the right skill. They didn't think Africa would ever be a place uh, to find such, such people. And now we're, we're dazzling people around the world with the talents we have. We're not Yahoo Yahoo people anymore, right? So how does all of this work? Right, I think that there are three big things that I've noticed. In my experience, you know, I've, I've worked within software, outside of software, uh, big company, small company. Uh, I've started businesses from scratch, and then I've also helped to grow and, and advise companies. There are three things I've learned that are extremely important, which I think today, from my experience in Nigeria, I don't think, yeah, we, we talk about them a lot, but we, I don't think we practice them. And they're all around leadership, right? I think we have a leadership crisis in our country today, and it's not being solved. So we uh, believe that we can help with that, and I think everyone here can. Uh, the first one is around building for a purpose. So no show of hands, but just let's take a second to think, you know, how many people here have a business or an organization whose mission statement is extremely clear to them? Where if you ask every employee, what is this company's purpose? They will tell you the same thing. So statistics show that 40% of employees around the world have no idea what their company's mission statement is. So they go to work every day, but they have no idea why they're there. Um, on the flip side, when you look at companies whose employees do know their mission statement, they have a 30% higher performance on average than their peers. So if it's so clear that having a mission is important, why don't we do it? It's not very obvious. Um, and I think one thing that, that we've learned is the biggest driver of success for Andela is the fact that everybody at Andela knows our single purpose. It is to create the future leaders of Africa. And we, every single decision we make helps to drive that home. Right? So that's number one, is basically build a company with purpose, and you'll find people flocking to you. The second is around hiring a team that is fit for purpose, and hiring people who are passionate about the jobs they're applying for. So one thing I always hear is people come to me and say, hey, Shani, um, my cousin is looking for a job. Or if people meet me and they say, hey, I'm looking for a job, it's Andela hiring. And I say, what would you like to do? And they say, anything. That is the most ridiculous answer you can give. You can't want to do anything. There's something you care about. And find somewhere where you can do that thing. Right? Everybody, if, if you look at the people that work at Andela today, uh, we have super geeks that just want to code. They don't want to be managers. They don't want to lead people. They just want to code. We have people whose dream and passion is to build amazing products. We have people who actually want to lead. We have people who want to do operations. And we try to specify, uh, we try to be very specific about the roles we hire for so that we can evaluate people properly. So our interview process is one of the most rigorous I've seen. It's one of the most challenging I've seen. I heard someone say, yes, maybe you, maybe you applied. 
Uh, but it's deliberately so, because each time you bring a new person into your team, you're basically changing the, the, the course of your company, right? So imagine putting Messi or Ronaldo as goalkeeper or defender. They'll either leave or they won't perform. So we think it's important to find people who are mission aligned. They want to, they believe in your cause and then put them in the right place. So the other day I went to a corporate office here in VI, or yeah, actually here in VI, and I got to the reception and the receptionist was giving me a, like a major attitude. And I realized she probably doesn't want to be there. And they probably never asked her if she deeply cared about that job. Just got a CV up, you know, put it and, and put it there. And so I think finding people who are fit for purpose, finding people who are mission aligned is very important. It saves you money. You have less angry customers. You have less failed products, and you probably do well. Uh, and the final one is around culture. This is one that I think um, we take for granted. So most people I know in Nigeria, they hate their jobs. Right? They just go in every day, pays the bills. Um, because leaders in Nigeria were very hypocritical. You say, I want my company, I want people to think of my company as their own. I want them to treat the business like it's their money. But then the leader is spending frivolously, right? You have people that run uh, you know, certain parts of our government who will say, Nigeria is very lawless. There's no law and order. But then at 4 p.m. when they're late for a flight, you see them with ten cars, siren, blowing people out of the way, right? And then they get to the airport and they say, oh, Nigeria is so lawless. This country is crazy. But, so we, we inadvertently contribute to the problems that we're complaining about, right? And it's because we don't realize, there's, there's, a, there's a statistic that shows when a leader is in the room, the number of eyes on them is usually orders of magnitude higher than the next person. So if you're in a room, people will look at a leader maybe 100 times more than look at anybody else, which is the most subtle things you're doing actually send a message. The things you smile about, the things you frown about, the things you approve, the things you don't approve, they, those things go to create the culture. Uh, and ultimately, I think we are responsible for the culture we create. Uh, and so my challenge to you, future leaders of this country and this world, uh, entrepreneurs who have a blank slate, is to go out and build the future we want to create. Now, there's a, there's a statistic that I think is extremely important, uh, which I'll, I'll leave with. So the number one killer of people today is stress. And the number one reason why people get stressed out is work. And the people that are most responsible for making work either a stressful place or not are the leaders. So seven people in our world, seven people die from stress every two seconds. Which means as I came up here, close to 100 people have died from stress because of poor leadership. And so I think the biggest takeaway for me is, um, yes, we're gonna learn to sell products and build businesses and do all that, uh, but without leadership, we'll never get anywhere. So please, uh, those three things. Build for passion, hire the right people into the right roles, and build a culture that will last. Thank you. Well, we didn't get dollars, but we got nuggets. Thank you, Shane. Um, the third speaker that we have, um, Raphael, Afiado. Raphael is, like many of you, a serial entrepreneur. I first met Raphael uh, as co-founder of Jumia. He is now co-founder of a, an MD of um, one of Nigeria's largest logistics and retail supermarket businesses. Um, so I think he will have quite a lot to share because I know many of you are serial entrepreneurs, and most entrepreneurs, before they reach success, have reached many failures. So please give them a round of applause. Good afternoon, everybody. Okay. Um, can you hear me well enough? Okay, so my name is Rafael Afaido. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, every time I'm introduced, I do not recognize myself. I'm just a simple person trying to make a living. Um, um, so in 2012, uh, we started Jumia. Jumia is the largest online retailer in Sub-Saharan Africa. Jumia is the largest online retailer in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and we started because we believe uh, that we started because we believe that technology is in the hands of the people 
and uh, people are going to be able to do their you know everyday transactions etc online since 2012 that we, when we started it it's grown tremendously um, we started then in Lagos we had about maybe 2,000 p transactions a day online in various forms from, from payment um, uh, through to like in you know, shopping and transacting um, I said sometime last year it was over 60,000 a day so it's grown super rapidly after two years of doing Jumia, we decided to leave, uh, my, my partners and I, we went and started two different companies. I started Supermart, which is an online grocery delivery service. And we chose to start Supermart for exactly the same reason that um, Shane spoke about, something that we could find purpose and passion in, um, which is really the fact that the women in our lives were spending so much time in traffic to be able to get the everyday essentials. Easily, they spend. Easily, they spend six hours uh, a day, uh, sorry, a week um, uh, to just buy groceries and everyday essentials for their house. So from going, uh, stuck in traffic to get to a supermarket, they find some of the items, they go to another supermarket before they find the rest. And if you're in a place like Nigeria, they have to go to the local market to be able to find the everyday other items that you eat. So a typical Nigerian meal will consist of things like snails, pomo, shaki, etc. names that you've not heard of. Um, which are not exactly being sold in the traditional retail outlets. We thought we could aggregate all of these to be able to like, you know, get and deliver to people some. And we've been at it for the last two and a half years, and it's been going well. What have we learned? We learned quite a lot of lessons building Jumia that I want to leave with you. One, with Jumia we raised a lot of money um, to be able to accelerate the growth of the market. I think the internet is going to be a massive game changer for us in sub-Saharan Africa. One of the lessons I learned, though, was the fact that there's something you call the new technology adoption life cycle. And uh, in spite of the fact that you can deploy a lot of capital to be able to accelerate the growth of your business, it sometimes might not be the smartest choice because you spend the money and you have to make up for the money later some way, somehow. On the contrary, you can focus on other things like customer experience, like understanding the systems and the processes that are able to manage your business at scale. Those cannot be accelerated. Um, a mentor of mine told me that nine women cannot make a baby in one month. Um, and, uh, and it's the same, right? So you can accelerate the growth, but the market will grow in, it, in its own good times. So when you're out there trying to develop or commercialize a new technology, be conscious of that. People have to go through that new technology adoption life cycle. People, some people are more open to new innovation and they warm up to it. I remember when we started Supermat, week one, we got an order for over $1,000. We're all shocked. And this was prepaid. And the guy just, we called the guy and he told us, I understand what you guys are trying to do. I'm just trying to support you. And ever since, whenever we've gone to raise money from investors, they've always asked, why did you grow so quickly in month one? And then you had to go down before growing again. And, and we, had to, we always have to explain that to them. So that's one. Um, uh, build the systems and the processes that actually will support the company before building that. The second thing I've learned is um, Sub-Saharan Africa is where Sub-Saharan Africa is um, for a reason. And, uh, and in as much as, as entrepreneurs we want to change the world, we also have to realize that we belong to an ecosystem. We have all sorts of cultural inhibitions that make it difficult for, for, that have made and put the continent where the continent is. So you find yourself having to build a culture that sometimes is not exactly in tune with the culture around you. So basic things like arriving on time. You have to be extremely regimented. You have to be extremely uncompromising to be able to get the people that you actually manage to recruit into your company to change the way they think about the world to become the way you want them to think about the world. Because ultimately, companies succeed on fail or fail based on the culture of the organization. Give me two different entrepreneurs and they'll go after the same problem and will end up with totally different results because of the culture that they've built. Um, uh, technology is going to grow in sub-Saharan Africa. I'm extremely excited. It's getting cheaper. It's getting more and more ubiquitous. Everybody here has a smartphone in their pocket something that was unimaginable five years ago. And it's happening so rapidly. In Nigeria, you have about 65% of the population under the age of 24. These people are connected in ways that our parents have never been connected. They have Twitter, they have Facebook, they have it on the go. Okay, you don't have to teach them technology. So technology is gonna be a game changer for us, depending on how we embrace it. So I urge everybody, 
Go after technology businesses if you can. Focus on the culture in your organization. Relent. It's going to be very difficult. It's been extremely difficult. But these things don't happen overnight. I tell people around me, I'm not building a company for three years or five years. So when I see a blip, when I see something that makes me uncomfortable, you know, I just take my time, give myself the space to understand it and fix it. Because really, if I was building a company for one year, I'll panic from one day to the next. But I'm building a company for 20 years, for 13 years. I'm doing my life's work. So if something is not going right for one month, I take the time, you know, work my, wrap my mind around it, and then try to go after it and be able to build a better company. For those of you in Nigeria, I'll leave you with one thing. We've created a coupon code called Elumelu, or Tony, or both, that you can use on supermart.ng, and you get 3,000 Naira off, and you can test out. You can test out our service, and, uh, and if you like it, we'll appreciate if you mention it. Thank you very much. Raphael, thank you very much. And our last speaker is Momar Tal, and, and Momar is one of your own, in that he was one of the winners of this, um, these sessions, I believe it was last year. And Momar comes from Senegal, I mean, excuse me, the Gambia. They separated from Senegal years ago and never came back and have been independent well before and will be well after. So pardon that error. He's from the Gambia and he is an entrepreneur that has focused on food processing. Um, class of 2016, from all the class of 2015 teepers or TEF now, <laughs> welcome and congratulations, enjoy the weekend and um, yeah, straight to business. Uh, I'm Mo Martal, I'm the founder of Tropingo Foods, um, we're a food processing company, uh, that's the simple way to put it. Uh, Tropingo Foods started as an idea, uh, in my country, we used to, I used to see mangoes wasted everywhere. Um, cows would eat them off the floor, people would kick them around like uh, football. Some were saying that happens here with, uh, with um, oranges, right? So uh, my idea was simple. It was let's create value out of things that usually go to waste. And um, I, was, I had an opportunity to travel to Canada and I saw how much people would pay for mangoes. And I said, uh, we cannot be throwing this stuff away anymore. So um, my company basically was to create, was to use a value addition to create value and integrate the rural farmers into the, the value chain. Um, we were successful at doing that uh, with the two main crops in Gambia, which are mangoes, number one, and peanuts, groundnuts. Um, so we, we created a system called RISE. RISE is um, rural, integration, um, rural integration strategy, um, basically get, getting farmers, smallholder farmers and uh, commercial farms to start supplying our company where we would buy everything at market price, um, add value to it and export it. And uh, we've been very successful at that. Uh, before we joined the Tony Alumelo Foundation, uh, we were doing, we had a turnover of twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000. And um, we saved a lot of money. We took the money that we had from Tony Alumelo and we invested wisely, and today we are doing, we did $1.6 million last year, and we're on track. Thank you. And uh, we're on track to do $2 million plus this year, so um, we're growing rapidly. Um, I say that to say this, last year this time I was sitting somewhere around here, and um, you know, I, all I had was a dream, and when I heard all the speakers up here, I was like, you know what? I'm gonna make something of myself. I'm gonna do what I can to get my business off the ground and be disciplined at it. And today, here I am talking to you. So a lot can happen in a year, right? What have I learned? What have I learned? Um, so I come from Gambia. Gambia is a very small country. You never hear about us on the news unless it's something negative, usually. Um, so, so that usually puts a damp on a lot of our confidence. And I think it's the same for Africans in general on the global stage. 
Um, what I learned is no matter where you're from, as long as you work hard and you deliver a good product and deliver value, people will take you seriously. So we started as a small company in Gambia, and this year we already expanded and we're doing business in Senegal um, and in the United States. And that's a small country in, in Gambia. It's a small country in Africa, sorry. And uh, that all started because I got the confidence in, of what I was doing and confidence in the product that I had. And we've been very successful so far because of that. Another thing I've heard is, I've learned is to be diligent, to be disciplined. Um, so you're gonna get this money from Tony Elimelo. What are you gonna do with it? How are you gonna turn it into $2 million? It's 5, 000, it sounds impossible, right? But um, more than the money, it's what you do on a day-to-day -day basis to create value in your company that turns $5,000 into $2 million. Um, so you have to, don't go and buy uh, a nice Rolex watch or whatever. No, I know it's tempting, I thought about it too. But, um, <laughs> you know. But, but trust me when I say it, within a year or two, you can buy five, six Rolex watches, right? Okay. And the third and final thing that I just wanna leave with you guys before I sit down is, um, when you're building your company, make sure you build it with a sense of purpose. The, um, I didn't build my company to make money. I love making money, money is a beautiful thing, but the reason I got into it was because I saw a problem that I wanted to solve. And I wanted to make sure as many people in my community benefit from my company as possible because I was tired of seeing um, foreign companies coming and exploiting us for the valuable resources that we have. Uh, so we made it very important to create I made a very important um, point to create employment. Uh, we employ 140 people seasonally and 20 full time. 80 of them are female. And we uplift these people by training them, mentoring them, doing a lot more things that go over and beyond my job because it's my responsibility now. So in my country, I'm seen as a success story where even though I feel like I have a long way to go, but if I don't start um, emulating what I believe in as a leader and uplifting people around me, then all of that goes to waste. I can't be the only beneficiary of what is happening around my company. So I want you guys to also try and affect as many people in your communities outside of your job role. Uh, and that's the last thing I want to leave you guys with. Thank you very much. Wow, fantastic. So um, I'm going to test my listening skills and just try to summarize briefly what we've, we've heard and then go to our panel for um, some questions. So Sharif talked a lot about um, managing the challenges of a business. He talked about focusing on growth. And he talked about something very interesting, which was being obsessed with your startup. And that means recognizing, in a way, what um, Umar was saying, the responsibility is on you 24-7. Um, and the last thing he mentioned was about taking risks. Um, you know, he's advising uh, against following whatever your parents and the old folks in your family have told you to do, but take a risk and take a different path to something that you believe in. Shaney talked to us about the fact that brilliance is distributed all over the world, but opportunity is not equally so. And then he talked about three things, I think, which are important about making the best or the most of the opportunity that you have as, a, as an entrepreneur. And that's being, one, building for purpose and ensuring that yourself and your employees are fully aligned on the purpose of that business. Secondly, he talked about hiring people that are fit for purpose and passion. And it's true, oftentimes when you're an entrepreneur, you're starting something, um, everybody in your family wants you to employ the long lost cousin, your friends and, and so forth, and you have to resist that and hire people that are fit for purpose and have the passion to follow your own company purpose. And lastly, he talked about culture and building the culture that you need. 
Now these three things I think were important to him because uh, if I recollect, he talked about the fact that the number one killer in the world is stress. And if those three things aren't working, you will probably be stressed. And then I wouldn't like to think about what may happen thereafter. The third speaker, Raphael, talked to us about what he'd done at Jumia and what he's done to um, now build Supermart NG. And I think the first lesson that he wanted to, or the first message he wanted to um, leave folks with was his message about um, focusing on the fact that the internet is a possible growth game changer in our markets and to follow these businesses, but to also recognize that there's a fact of reality in our, in our environment, and that is very, very slow adoption. Um, he talked about building systems and processes that actually support fully what your company is doing. And so when you're investing, to really focus on investing in those areas. And lastly, he talked about building the right ecosystem around your business. And that ecosystem is a large word, but what he meant was making sure that you have the culture and you build a business that actually with a culture that supports your overall objective and building a long and enduring institution. He told us that he doesn't want to be doing this for 10, 20, 30 years, but I presume that if he has the right people, is not stressed, he may actually be building an institution that's around for 50, 60, 70. And then our last speaker um, talked to us a lot about um, really seeing an opportunity in just the environment around you and, and seeing the opportunity that existed with mangoes that go to waste and recognizing that those mangoes had extraordinary export potential and created and wanted to create that value and take advantage of that value. Um, he left us with a few things. One is he was a winner here last year and he invested that money wisely. Um, and secondly, investing wisely I think was a lot about the discipline the diligence that he had in developing his business. He talked about the fact that no matter where you are, at the end of the day, if you have a great product that brings value, that people will be interested in, in, in acquiring that product. And above all, I think one of the things I took away was making sure that you have extraordinary confidence in your idea and in your product. And, and, to, and then theref therefore you can actually go after your dreams. So that's a quick summary of, of our four speakers. Um, I'm gonna open up to questions, but before I move to you, I have one of my own. Um, prior to starting uh, my principal investing firm, I was MD of a rather large um, global focused private equity firm called Actus. And I think one of the most enduring things that I learned at Actus was about, at the end of the day, if you're making an investment, yes, it's about the product, yes, it's about the systems and processes of the business, but it's also about the character of the leaders, the management, and the founders of those businesses. And if you don't have the right management team, you can have the fantastic product and you can end up with a terrible business and a very bad investment. So I want to ask our four panelists here because they're all leaders in their own right. What do you believe is the most critical attribute that you have, that you have brought to your business that would make someone like an actress or anyone else here truly invest in this business. Let's assume that the business is a fantastic business plan. What are the characteristics that you can share with these folks that make yours the most investable business around the leadership characteristics you have? So I'll just pass the Anyone want to volunteer? 
or should I have a victim? Okay. Okay, so um, what I'd say the most important character, um, me and my founder have actually, because we have a very similar background, we know each other since uh, school, is being meticulous. Very, very, very meticulous. So what we usually do is, um, I can tell you a short story or experience about being meticulous. When we're building our product, we've actually built the product all in all, maybe in nine months, including, uh, it's all proprietary technology, so we, we built everything from scratch. Um, and we technically could have launched Yauta much, much earlier, but we've decided not to do that because we weren't happy, in, happy with the product yet. I mean, we, we always thought it could be better. We can, um, we, we can make the UI simpler, the user experience, the, um, uh, the overall experience of uh, searching for a product and uh, shopping from the online store or the merchant. A lot of things we thought can be better. So we invested more time, we were much more meticulous in identifying things that can and should be improved. And that's why when we launched, uh, we, we, ha we had an immense growth, starting from one, month one, from the first month. Because the UI of it was very simple, we were focusing on simplicity, um, making it very effective and efficient to use by users to uh, find directly products they're looking for. So that's a small example of how important it is to be meticulous in everything and every process you take along your work in a startup. Thanks. Um, so I would say we focused a lot on being a business. Um, uh, we focused a lot on being a business from the very get-go. So we don't even think of ourselves as a startup. We never really did. I remember the very, very, very first um, interview that we did. The, the reporter referred to us as a startup. I'm like, no, we're not a startup. We're a, we're a business, right? So we do everything um, according to how businesses are supposed to do it proper financial records, doing things like paying employee taxes. Um, uh, you know, when we managed to put ourselves in the position where the company was big enough, you know, moving to things like, you know, health and medical, um, uh, HMO, they call it, health insurance for employees, etc. I think once you start thinking of yourself as a small business, you make a lot of choices that constrain your business, almost to be a small business. When you think of yourself as a small, big business, which is where you're ultimately going, you're thinking constantly about everything that you need to do to be able to be where you need to be ultimately, and putting them in place today. Um, that and being really, um, I've heard about metic meticulousness, I've heard about things like tenacity, all of those are important. But I think when we've gone and spoken to investors and we've raised quite a bit of money um, over time, though we prefer not to, not to talk too much about how much we've raised because we feel like sometimes it begins to focus um, attention of the company on raising money as if that's the business we are in. We have raised money quite a bit, but I think when we've spoken to investors, what they've liked about us is the fact that they see a business that is really running like a proper business should um, and not, you know, a small startup cutting corners. I guess my background and my partner's background also feeds into that. Both of us worked in a corporate for quite a bit before coming and we both of us um, co-founded Jumia also before, you know, starting Supermatch. So all of that feeds into our background. But being a structured business from day one is important. I think that's important too because of the nature of our service. Delivering groceries, you know, different items for different customers across the entire city, seven days a week. You need proper structure that people actually follow. Otherwise, things will just go bad. Um, I agree 100% with exactly what they said. Um, for us, it's uh, two things. I don't know if you can hear me. Um, one thing is that I'm incredibly cheap, so I cut costs wherever I can if it adds value to the business. So I'll give you an example. Because I'm extremely cheap, it's forced me to become innovative and it's been to the benefit of my company. So we live in Africa. One of the biggest problems that we have is electricity, for example. So being cheap and not having electricity 
you, you would think that doesn't go together because you have to spend more money to have energy, right? But for me, what I found was I'm creating this, I have so much waste from my peanut business and I need a lot of energy for my uh, grounded business. So what we did was we did a lot of research and we, we were innovative enough to find a solution where we started using our um, peanut waste, which is the shell, as to create the heat source that powers the machines that process the, the generators, right? So this, this now, this cheapness has saved me from buying a generator at crazy um, electricity costs. And uh, everyone who comes, they love it because it's also very green. Um, so being cheap is... Uh, <laughs> uh, in, in our case, I think maybe even stepping back to why the question is relevant. You know, so when you go to an investor, what do they care about? Uh, they really care about when they put the money in, is it going to go very far? And will they get a return in the future? Uh, so for me, I think at Andela, one of the biggest priorities for us, beyond the founders, beyond the management team, is can we find people that are fit for purpose? Um, most of the best ideas at Andela have actually not come from the executive team. They've come from people that we've hired who have had very genius ideas. I mean, like the idea you're talking about, we have the equivalent of things like that that we didn't think about, but someone else that we hired uh, did. Uh, and I think one of the things we're, we're, we're most proud of is there's a problem that human beings haven't solved today, right? And that problem is a problem of matching. So the divorce rate in many countries is over 50% because we're actually quite terrible at matching, right? Matching two people together, right? We're, matching, we're terrible at matching. Um, the unemployment rate is very high. You know, most, most companies have retention issues and in some places it gets beyond 50%. And again, you, you hire someone you think they're the best fit for your company and then they end up not being or you date someone and then you get married, you think this person is the person I'll be with forever, and actually more than half the time, that's false. Um, so one of the things we're most proud of is we're building the most innovative tool for being able to understand knowledge. So how do you figure out whether someone knows something? And therefore, how do you make sure that when you say this person is the right person for this thing, that is true 90% of the time, not 5% of the time, um, and that idea came from someone that was not a founder of Andela and was not one of the executive team members. Uh, it's from someone that's a genius, but uh, by far, you know, later downstream. So we, we are 100% confident, myself and everyone else on the Andela team, our ability to find people that are extremely smart, that are smarter than us, and our ability to motivate them to come and work at Andela is absolutely the most important thing for us. Okay, thank you very, very much. We have uh, meticulous. We have systems and processes and do it right first time. We have cheap. <laughs> <laughs> and innovative. Innovative. And really being a, very, a good leader and motivating uh, your teams to do the best and finding the right people. So I'd like to open it up to the floor. I, um, I see two microphones here and many hands going up. So what I'm going to ask you to do is if you can please just um, sort of move yourselves towards the two microphones. Uh, this gentleman here has been raising his hand very, very high, right there. Yes, not you, the one next to you. Yes, yes. So please um, do give your name, where you're from, and ask your question, and let us know who you're directing your question to. Good afternoon, everybody. 
Uh, I want to first of all thank uh, the organizers of the program for this awesome event. It's awesome. Um, my name is Saeed Oyeyemi Awojide. You can call me Yemi for short. I have two questions for any members of the panel. The first question goes thus. Um, how do you use new technology solutions in developing countries to convince them? Because I have a challenge. I am the co-founder of InnoCrave Solution. We are bringing green technology cleaning to Africa. Uh, one of our franchises in Kano, I just came back from Kano, and uh, our technology is steam technology at its best. Imagine you cleaning your car, no water on the floor, no soap, no chemicals, and it's better than the conventional way. But guess what? The people in Kano, they see it and they're like, no water, no soap, ah, you have to put water. You have to put soap. <laughs> without water, without soap, it's not clean. So how do you use new technology to convince a developing market and for you to be able to penetrate? That's the first question. The second question, um, now, uh, the technology I'm buying is I'm going Sa to ask you to keep it to one question, if you don't mind. So we'll take okay. your first one, all right? Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. And please don't put on the microphones on the, on the tables. The only microphones I will use for questions would be three microphones, one at that end, the second one, and then there's a third one here. So, so let's get a response to um, the, the first question. And, and clearly there are two of you that are very much in this, three of you in the technology area. So, so just, just in fairness, I'll skip on this one because I think they probably have better answers than I do. So. <laughs> no, I, think, I think you don't force new technology down people's throats. I tried to touch on it in my short presentation. There is what you call the new technology adoption life cycle. There are different people who are prone at different points in time to the new technology that you're bringing to the market. In my case, grocery shopping invariably is a new technology, right? Some people see online grocery shopping and immediately warm up to it. In some cases, it will be women in the house. In some cases, it will be men, it will be whatnot. But they're really more prone to that particular new, and it's always particular, very specific. So what you're supposed to do is to identify those people and go after them. And then after, so you call those ones the innovators. They're ready, they're ready. I mean, they just want somebody to like, you know, bring the solution to market. And it was the same one with the junior. After that, you have almost like the early adopters. Those ones need almost like feedback from the innovators who tell them that oh, this thing is actually working or they begin to hear it a bit in the mainstream press people talking about they need to hear it a couple of times and then they're like let me try this out again you can you can try to zone in a bit by trying to identify how they look like for something like grocery delivery these are people who work long hours they, they work in the offices etc we could almost go down to the level of the industry finance telecommunications um, uh, a big construction, FMCG. Um, so we identify these industries and we go directly to them. So you won't see Supermart, for example, doing billboard ads. We spent a lot of our time talking to banks, talking to the companies, the HR organizations, to tell the people in the organization that we can help them save time. As those people warm up to the technology, they'll tell other people, they'll tell their friends, they'll tell their moms, etc. And the good question I ask is, when I look around the room like this, and uh, people are all educated, as I know they come from parentage that are educated too. But I ask them, how many people's parents use the internet actively or will do something like grocery shopping online? The parents are not ready, even though they're educated, because they're further down. They're more like the mainstream. So you have the early mainstream, the late mainstream. So you have to think about who you're reaching and focus on those. As you saturate them, you move to the next um, segment and gradually work your way through. And definitely don't spend too much marketing money on that because you waste money.
Hello, Hello, Mike. I, th I think in my case it's a bit s simpler because we're an internet company. So what we're doing is we're basically piggybacking on the uh, growth of the number of internet users that we have in Egypt and in Africa in general. Uh, our concept or idea as, as such is not new. Price comparison has been there in the States and Europe uh, in the 90s before Amazon emerged. Uh, so since we are actually tackling a basic need of saving money, which is a universal need, regardless of the uh, social status, status or the uh, wealth of the individual or group, um, it's in a way, in a way, it's a natural natural product for people to use. Um, I think this is an advantage of internet companies in general versus um, companies that tackle very innovative uh, models that differ uh, extremely or immensely or substantially from existing uh, systems or ways of doing things. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, this was just luck. So, of course, I wouldn't encourage anyone to seek a business specifically tackled uh, in the internet or internet business just because of that because uh, it, it happens very often that offline businesses, I would call them offline, they're technology based but they're not based on the internet, uh, can add a huge value, immense value to the, to the users. So um, yes, um, I think that's why we're not really affected by, by that problem. Thank you. So let's go to this side of the room. Okay, good afternoon. My name is um, Ifan Emene. The name of my company is Counselor University. We offer and we help companies grow their productivity by offering them world-class technology-driven training wherever they are in Africa, even if they lack access to internet. Now, um, what we've been trying to do was um, investors, some people have been coming to us. They like what we do. They suggested some changes we need to make, which we are working on. But what I want to understand is, as we want to bring in investors, want to bring in maybe co-founders, what are the things you consider in giving out shares? So that maybe before you move from seed investment to round A, round B, round C, you don't end up giving out all your, capital, all your shares and owning less than 10% of, maybe it might look so big, but as it's getting bigger, you find out you don't own so much. So what are the things you consider in giving out shares so that when you bring investors along the line, you know, still have, a sizable chunk of the business belonging to you. Thank you. Very good question. Let me go first to Momar on that one. How have you managed that situation? Um, so, in my case, uh, we haven't raised any investment. We, we grew organically. But um, from my experience and um, learning from people who are a lot smarter than me, I think um, when you're looking for partners and you're looking for investors, look at what they're bringing to the table. Um, apart from the money, it's, it's very easy to say that we want someone to invest because we need so much money, but try and find a strategic partnership. Try and find someone who already has, let's say, a network of, you saying you're in, um, a, it's a university business, sir? Yeah, so somebody who's already in that field who can add value, maybe there's something that you need to spend money on, but they already have that infrastructure. So maybe that could be a way to trade off and not give up too much of your money by giving, um, by um, buying into your company. So look at innovative ways that you can partner with someone that doesn't only have to do with the money. Uh, that's from, that's what I think. I'll go to Shaney on this one, uh, and then I'll actually have a word also from uh, Raphael. I understand, Sharif, you've actually invested your own funds fully, and so you haven't raised any additional capital, or you've done one additional round. Okay. So, when, at Andela, we've raised our Series B. In total, from C to Series B, we've raised about $37 million total. Um, the number one thing is, the, most of the investors at Andela today, they have a mission statement that is very much aligned with ours. And so, in the investment world, I mean, when you, first of all, when you look at an investor, um, if an investor has your long-term interest at heart, 
they typically don't want most of your business. Because what will happen is, there's a point in time where the entrepreneur looks around and says, well, what's in it for me? And if it doesn't feel like it's big enough, they start to lose motivation. So the smartest investors actually don't want to take your business over. And I think Nigeria is one of the few places I've seen where investors are okay asking for 80% of someone's business, right? Like for some crazy amount, some small amount of money. It doesn't make any sense because ultimately that's why people always try to go around their own businesses and create side businesses because there's not, in it, there's not enough in it for them. So the number one thing I would say look for is kind of like how we say look for people that are aligned with your mission as employees. Look for investors who are aligned. Investors who want to see the thing you're creating happen in the world. They'll usually want you to go as far as possible. And right now, you know, folks like uh, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, you know, Mark Zuckerberg and his wife, um, folks like Spark Capital who invested in Facebook when there were only eight people, um, those are people that believe that there should be software developers representing every society in the world. And so when they invest in Andela, they're really investing in building that thing which they can do themselves. So they're usually very generous. I think um, it's important to be able to articulate a long-term vision for the business. Where exactly are you taking the business in the very long term? And when you're able to articulate that, you're able to now bring it down to milestones from where you are to where you, when, when you get there, and then try to almost, almost have an idea of what you need from one milestone to the next one. And you're literally trying to raise money to get from here to the next point. Because you know where you're going and you know the steps in the way there, you now know how much of your company you can give away now, you can afford to give away then, etc. cetera, and, and, and in, in, order, in order to be able to get to the destination, still owning a significant part that makes you stay motivated in the business. That's one. And then the second one is you're supposed to also have an idea of the value, uh, the valuation of your business. Right, so there are other metrics that you can use. Look at other people that have raised money um, in the line of business, how big they were, etc. I come the internet and I find revenue numbers or proxies to be able to use. And what you're trying to do is just raise enough money to be able to take you from where you are to the next point. Because what happens is if you give away too many, much of your company too early, later on it hurts. Um, so you want to really just try to understand where you're taking the business over time. Try to be as frugal as possible, so you don't have to raise money, but when you do, um, just raise as much as you can. And I can tell you about some of the things that you can do to be frugal. Uh, my company, for example, we don't do cash on delivery. And everybody says, um, you know, you need to do cash on delivery to be able to grow, but I'll tell you two secrets about cash on delivery. One is you change the cash flow cycle to go against you. What makes you have to go buy inventory, take it to the customer, and hope that you find the customer and collect money. You're almost like in a negative cash cycle. So as you grow, you need more money. We flip that on its head and say we're going to focus on good service delivery and insist that our customers have to pay upfront. What does that do? It means that we collect customers' money. It's on our books while we're growing. So as we're growing the business, we have a, a fatter and fatter bank account, which also means that we don't need to raise as much money. Because what do you raise money for? You raise money to be able to pay the bills immediately bills that you have. As long as you have money sitting there, you don't need investor money. Right? So smart choices like this can take you very far and, and the rest is just making sure you focus on delivering a good product. If you do that, you can ask people to pay up front. Thank you very much. I would just say on that question as an in investor, one of the things I find with a lot of young entrepreneurs is sort of either fall on two sides. One, people who undervalue their businesses, but there are a significant number of entrepreneurs who tend to overvalue the business and the sweat that they've put in. So you also have to leave enough value in for your investor, otherwise you will not find an investor. And people often make that mistake. Um, your investors, particularly if you're on a, C, a Series A round, they're not only bringing money, but oftentimes they're actually build, bringing experience and value that can help take you further than where you would go on your own. So you've got to compensate them sufficiently for that risk and the value that they're also bringing. And a lot of entrepreneurs tend not to do that. The second thing I watch out for is an entrepreneur who overvalues or an entrepreneur who is trying to get out too soon. If I'm in a business with you and you want to cash out, 
or your horizon is actually quite short, I will not invest in that business because you've got to have sufficient skin in the game that it is of significant interest to you to reach the end goal and to at least give your investors two and a half times their money, minimum. So that's just a, a, a thought. I'm gonna um, move back to this side of the room, this all the way over here to the other side of the room. And I think we'll probably have, after this question, time for only two more. I'd really appreciate if you could direct your question to someone, yeah. okay? Yeah. So please go ahead. Hello. Um, my question is directed to Shaney. Um, uh, and Della, and it's like a request. Um, so, um, I am Akinike Michael Lulua Tubiloba, um, founder and team lead of um, Young Protege Leadership Foundation. Um, we have um, innovated the first African leadership paper board game. Um, and it's amazing. We were a non profit sourcing for partnerships, sourcing for people to give us finances, but we were not getting finances. So, um, we eventually stumbled on this innovation that puts uh, what we actually want to drive at, um, teach leadership to um, kids and young people, and we um, have a board game that teaches leadership, and we have amazing um, feedback from people who play it. Um, and um, we have sold about 2,005 copies, meaning that four kids can play at a time, 10,000 people are getting basic leadership skills or values from our game. So, um, but we haven't been able, um, the markets, the chain, haven't been flowing because um, like we have a customer today and the customer is not coming back, blah, blah, blah. So I, um, and you, I, every one of you have talked about leveraging on um, um, technology. So I want you um, in Andela with me, partner together to modify our game into social into a software application that will help us reach at least one million children in Africa um, so that we can build the Africa that we want. Um, many African leaders build um, followers, but I see that leaders need to build leaders. We need more leaders because um, Africa's problem is not a, a lifetime, um, it's not going to be solved in a lifetime. I believe in building trans, transgenerational leaders, and I want me and Andela to do it together. So, if you don't mind, um, I will be um, so much grateful if we can go into this partnership together and reach out to Africa. Um, Shaney, I think you have a problem. There's, there are only two answers to that request, yes or no. Let me leave you for a moment. We'll go to a question so that you can just stew on that. So let's go back this way, this way, then we'll finish over there. All right. All right, thank you for this opportunity. My name is Chigo Zero KK. My name is Chigo Zero KK, and I am the CEO of the Market Square Services. The Market Square Services is an online retail that targets students. So I'm directing my question to, Ms., uh, to Mr. Raphael. So I just came out from the university last month, that is September, I just graduated. And when I tell people that I'm about to launch a startup, they always tell me that since I don't have any work experience that it is likely going to fail. So I want you to, to maybe tell me, is it actually true that if you don't have <laughs> If, if you don't have any work experience before going into your entrepreneurial journey that, it, that your startup may actually um, not succeed or if I should go ahead and do what's in my mind. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, Look, small companies um, have a very, very high mortality rate, um, no matter your level of education. Um, so um, there's a chance that it will fail, um, but that should not deter you from trying. I think more important is you get a ton of experience 
even if your company fails from actually having run a company, you learn a lot across both from markets and whatnot. I can't even imagine being able to learn so much um, working, for, work, working for a traditional organization, maybe apart from working for another startup. So there's value in actually, if you're already at the point where you want to go in there, there's value in going in there. But I normally do advise that people get um, some experience before actually jumping in. Um, uh, and, and, uh, and it doesn't really matter what kind of experience. You can go do some banking somewhere. You can do consulting. You can join an FMCG campaign that teaches you marketing, operations, whatever. But getting experience a startup is also very valuable. Getting real life experience is very helpful. Because when you go and talk to people later on, how professional you are makes a difference. I found myself introducing people to maybe an organization where they wanted to do business. And just basic emailing and, you know, the professionalism, setting up a meeting, showing up for the meeting, it's lacking. And I'm like, you're not going to keep this business if this is how you are. So working for somebody is actually not as bad as, as it's made to look. Actually, even working in a salaried job is not bad. I think we find something where we actually can add value and we go hard after it. But again, if you are at the point where you want to start, Start, but know that there is a lot that you don't know that you need to learn. So you have to find the right kind of community and learn as much as you can from your professional friends. And also, find partners who are smarter than you in other things. I, my partner today, uh, my partner in Jimia and I, you could not think of people who are more different, right? He's much stronger in some things than I am, and some other things are much stronger. We complement each other. Don't knock experience, and if you haven't got it, find some gray hair to join your team. It's helpful. All right, uh, what, you came from here, so I'm going over here, and then we'll have one last question after this on this side of the room. Good Please afternoon, go all. My name is Blessed. I'm the founder of Style Revamp Africa. It's an initiative to, you, you know, like, the second highest cost of pollution is actually clothing. We have a lot of clothes that we really don't use and we just leave them hanging in our wardrobe because we probably buy them and don't need them or we buy them and they're not our size or we just outgrow them one thing or the other. We just waste clothes. So my idea is to revamp clothes. My question goes to Momartal. At what point do you... Okay, a lot of businesses fail due to overcapitalization where... We're small businesses, but we want to pay rent, we want to buy this, to have an outlook of a big business, and we are really not ready for that, and we can't afford it. And you said something about being cheap, and that sort of caught my attention. But how do you find that balance between knowing, to, knowing when to innovate for quality and knowing when to pay for quality? And also, about skills and culture, how in what ratio, in what proportions do you balance that when hiring people? Thank you. I think that's a very important question. I think it's something that we all battle with. Um, there's one quote I keep in my head anytime um, I want to buy something, I want to pay for a service. I ask myself if it's necessary first, and um, this is how I do it. I ask myself, do I want to go broke trying to look rich? You know, so if you're going to invest in something in your business, are you doing? Are you investing in a big storefront because uh, your company needs it, or you just want to feel like you have the presence? Um, when I started my business, um, like I told you before the Tony Elmelu uh, money, I started with what I had. I said, "This is what I have. This is what I need to do. I'm not going to go and invest in a huge warehouse and factory because I simply can't afford it. I'll have it sitting there and it won't be productive." What I'm going to do is I'm going to take this, let's say $10, and I'm going to buy $5 worth of this, and I'm going to turn it to 15 Start there. Start from the basic minimum. And that's what an entrepreneur is. It's the best of what you have. Um, once you, if you have that mentality, no matter how big your company grows or how much money you're looking to make, uh, you won't have this um, fear or this conflict of overspending because you always spend on what is necessary. And I think that's one of the most important things. Um, to your second question, which is about skills. Um, when I'm hiring uh, staff, one of the major problems I do have is getting the right, um, especially with, uh, we, just, we, just we just opened a new mango factory and getting the right skills on board has been very difficult in my country and it's something I'm still struggle struggling with now. Um, but uh, I think you've spoken a lot more about hiring and I think that you'd be the best person to 
<laughs> I mean, answer that question. But for me, uh, I, I just look for people who are motivated, who believe in the vision of the company, who have the ability. So I, I test a lot of my staff without them knowing it. I test their initiative. I test the things that I need them to do, because right now I'm not in Gambia, but my company is running. So I need to know that people are going to put in as much work as I would if I wasn't there. So there's a couple of tests that I have that I can probably share with you in private if you just meet me later. And it's just different ways to gauge. To gauge, There's not much time, so I don't want to take up too much time. But just different ways to gauge the ability of the people that you're about to hire. I think that's very important. You need to know what their ability is before you hire them. Thank you. I'm going to break my own protocol. Um, I, we have some friends from other countries, and I know Nigerians uh, always like to dominate. So I just want to see, do we have some friends from another market who would like to ask a question? I understand there are some friends from DRC who would like to ask a question. Please come forward, and then I see another little timid hand here. So why don't you stand over there? You, you know what? Why don't you ask your question? I'll see if I can translate. Allez-y. Je vais essayer de traduire. Hein? Vas-y. Je vous entends pas, hein? Bonjour. Okay. Bonjour à tous. Euh, je me nomme Didier Oulé, je viens de la Côte d'Ivoire. My name is Didier Oulé, I'm coming from Ivory Coast. Euh, nous travaillons dans la formation ou dans l'initiation aux gestes de premier secours. We are actually helping into first safety. Voilà. This is what we do in our company, first safety. Aujourd'hui, euh, s'il y a une chose que tout le monde aime, ce sont leurs enfants. And today, there's something that everybody actually likes. We all like children. We all love them. Que vous soyez un homme, une femme, pauvre ou riche, vous aimez tous vos enfants. Be it a man or a woman, if you are poor, either if you are rich, we all love children. Vous êtes prêt à faire d'énormes sacrifices pour vos enfants. And you are ready to make the sacrifices for these children. Il est question pour nous d'initier vos enfants ou ceux qui ont la protection de vos enfants au geste de premier secours. So what we are really trying to do is to raise this awareness with the people who are taking care of your children so they can actually have the first aid gestures that are necessary to take care of your children. On s'est rendu compte que dans notre pays, personne ne maîtrise les gestes de premier secours. And we actually realize that in our country, no one masters the skill. Nous avons décidé d'aller dans des établissements privés pour donner des cours d'initiation aux gestes de premier secours aux enfants et aux personnels enseignants. So we decided to go into all the private schools in our country and to make sure that people understand the first aid gestures, actually everything that has to be done HSC wise, just in case children need anything. Tu vas poser la question? Ok. Mais on a un problème. Les enfants ne comprennent pas le même langage que les grandes personnes. Now we have a problem is that the children do not understand the same language as Il... the adults. Ils veulent un langage imagé en image. They want a language which is easy to understand, so images, cartoons. Voilà pourquoi l'intervention de M. Saïd a attiré mon attention, parce and que c'est ça ma préoccupation. And this is what I'm specifically concerned about. This is why your intervention actually speaks to me. You spoke about the images and the cartoons you are using. C'est-à-dire, comment, comment apprendre à travers les images, à travers... Uh, des dessins imagés, les gestes de premier secours aux enfants. How can we actually teach that to the children, not just to the adults, to use those images, those cartoons, in order for them to understand the language we are trying to teach them? Voilà, donc uh, je veux qu'il m'explique son process, comment est-ce qu'il a contacté les développeurs, comment est-ce que ça s'est passé au fait, parce que c'est ça mon souci, comment rendre imagé mon message. This is my priority, I want you to understand, how did you contact the developers in order to achieve that? Where did you start to get the the result that you got. Okay, so the, the best approach I see in software development in general is actually something that's less technical. 
And will you translate one to one or? Okay. Uh, it starts with a very non-technical approach. The first thing you need to think about is the user interface, meaning that what would the children see? Do not think about the technicalities, do not think about the developers, do not think about uh, which code you're going to write or which programming language you're going uh, you're gonna to use. Don't even think about which developers you're going to get on board before you know exactly what the user interface looks like, meaning, in your case, what the children are going to see, what the end, end product is going to uh, look like. Uh, you need to make a design of that and, uh, with very simple tools. This could be even PowerPoint or uh, any, any, uh, any, any kind of uh, image, image processor. Once you have that, um, this, this exercise is very important because it makes you think and improve what the end product is going to look like or how the end product is going to look like. And that's the most important thing. So before starting to contact developers or uh, think about anything technical, uh, sit down with yourself and, and, and others uh, and, and get, of course, the feedback of others as well, especially children, test it on children, and uh, draw and design how the product uh, looks like or should look like. And then any experienced developer can translate your requirements or uh, your design into workable code. That's, that's, that's actually their job. They're, you wouldn't need to care about uh, how to do it. It's your job. Their job is to get a design and translate this design into a, a software package and a, an application. Uh, that's how I would, uh, I would tackle the problem. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm feeling horribly guilty because time is actually up. Um, so I'm not uh, able to take any more questions. Um, perhaps you can catch up with the speakers. Actually, I have a quite short question. Sorry? I have a short question. <laughs> since, since I'm the one who got you to stand up yeah. and you're not a Nigerian and we want to welcome our friends from other countries, please thank let's just take this thank last you. one uh, I'm uh, Reda Saouli from Algeria uh, my question is um, you told us about your success story but we want to know, have you faced failure before success? was worth the question. <laughs> Where do you want to start? All of them. Okay, so we're going to do this in speed round. Each person, you have 45 seconds. Go. Uh, absolutely, yes. Uh, I feel every single day. <laughs> Even now, literally. Uh, one of the biggest ones is uh, a couple of years ago, you know, I started this um, online magazine that was meant to help a lot of my peers to get answers to questions that we all have. And uh, it started off, it did really well. I had like 18,000 views. And then I was trying to build a team then. I didn't really understand anything about building a team. And I kept doing it myself. And six months later, uh, we, we had no traffic whatsoever. Um, I made all the noise about it. So massive failure up until now. I'm still trying to revive it. It's not working. <laughs> yeah, um, I think failure is just a part of the process. Uh, I fail all the time. Um, so when I started uh, Tropingo Foods, uh, the first capital I got, like you said, the FFNF, your friends, fools, and family. People gave me money to do the business, and I didn't know anything about the business. I was just very hard-headed, and I went in there, and I lost every single cent, and I was, I thought that the world was over, because you always have that fear in your head that, you know, when you fail, how are you going to face people? And a few weeks passed by, and I looked around, I'm like, listen, I'm still alive, you know? And, uh, you know, like my mom always says, but did you die? And I didn't. So... I didn't die and I decided to make sure that I learned from my failures. I, the failure taught me the business. The failure taught me what not to do. And I used that to get really good at the business. Yeah, I know I'll sound a bit, it will sound a bit cliche, but I, I also fail all the time. Um, uh, I think it comes with the territory. I personally am in a bit of a reality distorted feel, field where I don't really remember much the failures because I don't dwell too much on them. I just see them as part and parcel of the process. So 
I see it more as a point where I stop to understand what is going on and then fix what is happening and then go on. At the same time, I also make sure that while I risk, I don't go out there taking risk, I manage risk, right? So try to understand all the various variables there, make the smartest choice that I can, and if it doesn't work well, take a step back, understand and keep going. And I don't dwell too much on it, to the point I don't remember it. Well, as a co-founder, uh, I'm not a serial entrepreneur yet. It's my first uh, business, so let's hope it succeeds. <laughs> but at a personal level, uh, after I finished my studies, um, it was around 2009, it was the downturn, the economic crisis, and uh, I literally made more than 150 applications 150 applications, I didn't get accepted in any of, the, of them. Before, I got accepted in a management consulting firm and it started up from here. So those of you who are not ready yet uh, to, to, to start their own businesses and are applying, definitely do not get um, discouraged of that. Thank you very much. So, Thank you very much to our speakers, and thank you. You've all been a terrific audience as well. And um, I wish you luck. Have a wonderful rest of your program. Ngozi, thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, Ngozi deserves a very big round of applause. I hope it's not, it's not lost on the entrepreneurs. She is also an inv a potential investor. So please do not fail to pitch your business you know, to her as well. Um, the photographers have requested for a group photograph with the panelists and the moderator. So you could just stand up here whilst we do that. A round of applause for them whilst we do that. Okay, it's, um, it's time for lunch. We're going to break for lunch now. And I understand that lunch is served. We are... Decade-long commitment of $100 million to grow 10,000 African entrepreneurs. 1,000 were selected from 20,000 who applied from 52 African countries. Born, educated and made in Nigeria, Tony Elomelu is a new generation of African business leaders driving its economic transformation. Businessman, investor, entrepreneur, philanthropist and avowed Africapitalist, he holds the Nigeria National Honors